Thanks, Emily. Thank you, church. Represent second service. Yeah. Sometimes I feel a little suspicious about you guys. You guys are a little quiet, but that's all right. I'll make up the noise for the both of us. Um, Okay, if you got a Bible, will you open it to Matthew chapter 8, verse 18? We are in a continuing series, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the book of Matthew. And we're in a subsection of that series called The Kingdom is Upon Us. Before we jump in, I want to introduce myself. For those of you that haven't met me, my name's Andrew Adams. Um, I'm the new associate guy here. Um, So if you haven't met me, pull me aside and say what's up. I'd love to get to know you guys, hear your story, pray for you, encourage you in any way. So yeah, love you, Reach. I'm so stoked to be here. I hope you guys are stoked to be here. We're going to have a good time getting in God's Word. That's right, Jeff. Mm -hmm. He's ready to get in the Word. All right, enough about me. You guys ready to jump in? All right, so the beginning of chapter eight, Sean told us two weeks ago that Jesus is coming down from the mountain. So what we're about to read is taking place right after the Sermon on the Mount. Um, And the Sermon on the Mount is really Jesus's declaration about the consistency of the kingdom of heaven. Again, Sean covered that, and um, Jesus comes down the mountain, and he begins to heal people. There's three specific healings that display Jesus's authority to heal. So in other words, Matthew five through seven, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus declares the kingdom. In Matthew chapter eight, Jesus begins to show the kingdom, the kingdom of God. So the passage we're about to read is written by St. Matthew, and it's to a Jewish audience. And Matthew's focus is to show them that Jesus is their long-awaited king. And he has authority beyond any of the scribes and Pharisees. Remember Matthew chapter 7? The crowds are shook. They're like, whoa, he has authority beyond anyone else we've ever seen. But Matthew's also going to focus on this idea that Jesus is a rabbi. Rabbi is this Hebrew word which means teacher, master, or for our purposes today, discipler. And we're about to learn that Jesus doesn't just have the authority of a king, he has the authority to disciple us. All right, will everyone please stand as we read Matthew chapter eight, verse 18 through 23. When Jesus saw a large crowd around him, He gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. A scribe approached him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, Foxes have dens, birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere, no place to lay his head. Lord, another one of his disciples said, First, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. As he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You guys can take a seat. Will you guys join me in prayer real quick? King Jesus, we, uh, yeah, we want to invite you here this morning. We want to make space in our day, in our hearts, to encounter you. We want to submit ourselves to your words, Jesus. We believe that these words are authored by you, inspired by you, and authoritative over our lives. Would we honor you right now by submitting ourselves to them? Would we seek to know you We pray that you would bind the enemy from distracting us, from stealing the seed of the gospel, from lying to us, Jesus. We just pray that you would use us as your instrument, the church, the people of God, to disciple the nations. We also ask, Spirit, that you would be here with us, that you would draw us close to you, 
that you would reveal and illuminate the meaning of the scriptures to us. I ask Jesus, would you use a broken, humble man like me to declare your goodness and your glory and the mighty acts of God? Would you move in this time and in this place? We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, church. Here's why Empire Strikes Back is the best movie ever. Amen. Second service. I trust you now. You know what's up. And it's not just the best Star Wars movie, it's really the best movie of all time, okay? It's this amazing, amazing story about this ragtag group of people called the Rebel Alliance and their fight against the evil galactic empire. And even more than that, it's really this fun tale of this boy named Luke Skywalker. And Luke is a recently orphaned farm boy. And here's the cool thing. He is gonna learn, follow in the footpath of the Jedi. He's gonna grow into what it means to become a Jedi. Now, I love this movie for a handful of reasons. Number one, it has tropes, but done well, okay? So it's good versus evil, light versus dark, but it's actually like done really well. It's not cheesy and boring, okay? So it's this beautiful story of friendship, learning, growth, trials, tribulation, epic proportions of light and dark. So you got the Princess Bride and you got Empire Strikes Back, okay? It's pretty, it's pretty good. Now, it also details this thing in a story critique we call the hero's journey. And the hero's journey, it, it's, this, uh, it's this narrative device, really, that goes all the way back to ancient Greece. And it's cool because we actually see a lot of its roots within scripture itself. The hero's journey is depicted as this. The hero or the would-be hero has a departure from his home. And then an initiation, this moment where he's really pushed over the line into manhood or into herohood, if you will. And then there's a return where he comes back to his people. He comes back to his town as the hero to rescue them. Kind of cool. You see that in Luke Skywalker's journey and in the redemption of Darth Vader. Spoiler alert. Sorry. It's an old movie. It's on you. Sorry. Um, it's also culturally formative. So if you guys know, that, like, if you're really into movies and you've seen a lot of trilogies, usually the second movie in a trilogy is like the dark one where like there's like gnarly stuff going down, like we're talking the Spider-Man franchises, X-Men, Lord of the Rings, and it all, especially, especially Indiana Jones. Man, Temple of Doom, shh, too dark. So this all comes from Star Wars. Star Wars is kind of like the first one to really kick off that pattern of like the really epic hero's journey in the second movie. It's also just really well written. It's a fun movie, lots of fun dialogue, character development, um, just an all around good time, family movie. Go and watch it. Okay, um, but here's my take. I think that if we look closely at this movie, we're just gonna see like a fun allegory for discipleship pop out of the narrative of Star Wars. It's kind of a loose allegory. Don't take it too seriously. Don't go home and sit in front of the TV with Matthew chapter eight and be like, Andrew said it was right here. I don't see what he's talking about, okay? It's a loose allegory. It's not as masterful as Lord of the Rings and it's not as obnoxious as Chronicles of Narnia. It's there, okay? So here's what we see in per uh, pertaining to discipleship from Star Wars. Number one, there's a master. And this figure is learned. And he takes on an apprentice who doesn't know anything. He's a noob, okay? Number two, the apprentice has to learn over many years, trials and tribulations, under the tutelage of his master to learn the way of his master. And number three, this path of learning, this journey, we read discipleship, requires mental ascent. He has to engage his mind and learn the teachings. It requires physical discipline. He has to train himself and his body to do what it couldn't do. And lastly, it culminates in this metaphysical or spiritual rebirth moment that's kind of initiated by self-sacrifice or self-death. And that's really why we find it so compelling is there's this beautiful, sacrificial, redemptive story. 
Now, universally, take a step away from Star Wars, we all know that discipline, sacrifice, redemption, these are all excellent and beautiful values. We see these in in cultures across the world. Now, as Christians, we believe that redemption is possible through self-sacrifice. Not our own sacrifice, but the sacrifice of Christ, right? Now, here's where it gets interesting. Narrative forms culture. The stories we tell ourselves and celebrate form our lived experience and the things that we see in our society. While Empire Strikes Back is formed, it comes from this Judeo-Christian society, 2023 is far removed from that, would you agree? We live in a very different culture and society that doesn't celebrate things like redemption through self-sacrifice. And it's passages like Matthew 8 are kind of tough for us to get because we don't, we don't live in a, in a monarchy. We don't live in Great Britain. We don't have a king and a queen. So concepts like lordship and authority are kind of like, whoa, are you trying to tell me what to do, Bible? And so we need to understand the culture that we're coming from. Our culture is saturated in radical individualism. It's all about you. You decide your path. You decide your life. We live in a very consumeristic culture. Everything is a product to be consumed with promises of giving you your best life. So our narratives inform the culture that we live in. We need to understand if we're gonna be disciples of Jesus, Jesus doesn't just call us into discipleship, he also calls us out of the culture we live in. So the path of discipleship is coming into the kingdom of God and coming out of the culture we live in. Does that make sense? So here's what I mean when I say that. I don't mean like holy huddle, Christian ghetto, shield yourself from the world, okay? Hide your kids, hide your wife. I mean, think of the Exodus, when God called the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, but he had to take 40 years to get Egypt out of them. Does that make sense? He calls us into the kingdom and out of the cultures of this world. And this is where we're at as a church today. We have a problem. We think this is how it works. You get saved and you're good to go. Welcome to the club, see you next Sunday. Think every head bowed, every eye closed, raise your hand, and there you go, that's all it is. But here's the reality. That is the first step in discipleship. That is merely entrance into the kingdom of God. Jesus calls us out of these broken kingdoms and calls us in to the kingdom of God, disciples us into it, and it's a process that involves many steps, and it's usually a costly one. The issue for us is when we come to discipleship, We look at Jesus like, you're not the king, I'm the king. Your job, Jesus, is to make me feel good about my life, pick me up when I'm feeling down, put on some Bethel music and make me feel better, right? Now here's the deal. We're in a discipleship crisis. We need to acknowledge this. The author of the book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, When Christ calls a man, he bid him to come and die. Can we just sit with that for a second? Do we actually believe that about our relationship with Jesus? Do we actually believe that Jesus has called us out of this world and to die to our former life? Or do we think, I'll take a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of spirituality, I'll take communion on Sunday, and I'm good to go. Barna, they report that 67% of high school graduates who leave to college will eventually leave their faith. That's far more than half of the young people in this nation, when they leave to college, they're gonna leave their faith. That's a crisis. The creed of our church era is, it's not a religion. It's a relationship. Have you guys ever heard that before? 
You're like, Andrew, why are you hating on me right now? Sorry. We get it. None of us like being told what to do. We're tired of being judged. We're tired of doing things that are really hard and feeling like we have to, we have to work really hard for our spirituality. If you guys remember last week, Sean quoted this stat from Barna, that 47% of Gen Zers and millennials believe that it is unethical to share their faith in hopes that someone would become a Christian. That's the point of the gospel, that we would disciple others and disciple them into the kingdom as we are being discipled into the kingdom. Now we could read stats till the cows come home, and I don't wanna bum us out, here's the point. We don't believe the king is the center of his kingdom. We believe that we are, you are. Human progress, consumerism, popular acceptance is the center of the kingdom. I don't wanna get you guys too sad, so I'll share you a little story from my youth pastor days. Is that okay? I don't remember the specific sermon, but it was the classic youth pastor ending. And that's why we need to read our Bibles. And then we broke up into small groups, and the whole point of small groups was to discuss Bible reading, and are we doing it, and where we're at. And I was walking around as a youth pastor from group to group, checking in on them, seeing how the conversation was going, seeing if I could support the small group leaders. And I remember popping in on this specific small group. There was a high school girl, and she said this. I don't believe in reading my Bible. I just don't think Jesus would ask me to do something that makes me uncomfortable. Because you know, it's a relationship, not a religion, right? And her small group leader just went, help. And I walked away from her. Just kidding. (laughs) Jesus has become our therapist, our life coach, our cheerleader, and we've become the main character in our story, fighting for the enshrinement of our identity, the unconditional celebration of our every behavior. Discipleship is all about me and what I get out of it. And God better not ask me to sacrifice myself. We've lost lordship. We've lost obedience. Discipleship is seemingly dead. So we need to be asking ourselves, what is Christ calling us as the church to do in this moment? Should we return to more traditional values? Harken back to the yesteryear of America. Does discipleship need to change? Are we asking too much of people? Is the world just so busy, so modernized, so digitized that there's no more room for antiquated things like mentorship, relationship, and accountability? Should we just give it up and hand discipleship over to the robots? (laughs) The call of the faithful, the call of the church, is to always follow Jesus. Our move and our answer to the blood-curdling screams of culture cannot be a watered-down gospel. We must be wise still to not swing the pendulum and avoid the, the folk religion of American past. For followers of Jesus, our play is costly discipleship. And what we'll see when we dig into Matthew chapter eight is Jesus sets his terms for discipleship. And that discipleship is costly. When we dig into the passage, we're gonna see two points emerge, I think. Number one, discipleship disrupts our expectations. Number two, discipleship reprioritizes our life. If you're taking notes, You got a pen, pencil, highlighter, get ready. We're gonna jump in. You guys ready? Sick. Matthew chapter eight, verse 18. When Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. So we're reminded that while Jesus has spent the last four chapters with the crowds, he's not a man of the crowd. Jesus isn't in this for popularity or celebrity, yes, He loves the crowds. In fact, later in Matthew's gospel, we'll see that he has compassion on them. He sees them as lost sheep without a shepherd. He'll even feed them. But Jesus is not the opioid of the masses. 
He's not merely an artist thriving off of the excitement of the crowd. Jesus serves the will of his Father. The kingdom Jesus is building is the kingdom of heaven, not one that appeals to our consumptive desires and not one that's purposed around our needs. Something else we're gonna see in the book of Matthew, I want you guys to think about this in the weeks to come. Matthew is just this literary artist. And he's gonna tell us through literary device and mechanisms um, some, some cool stuff. Matthew has this compare and contrast of two different groups of people. Matthew will talk about the crowds, group number one, and he'll talk about the disciples, group number two. And both of these groups are following Jesus everywhere but there's a difference in how they follow him. Does that make sense? The crowds will refer to Jesus as teacher. The disciples will refer to Jesus as Lord. Yet while surrounded by the crowds, Jesus commands his disciples to cross to the other side of the Galilean Sea. We're reminded of his authority. Jesus has positioned himself as the fulfillment of Mosaic ministry. Remember Moses on, uh, on the mountain giving the Ten Commandments? Jesus is a better leader than Moses, a better deliverer, and he has purposes elsewhere than the needs of the crowds. Verse 19, a scribe comes to Jesus and he says, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. This is what most of us would wanna hear, right? We're like, okay, cool, you're in. Now Jesus has just come off his tour de force sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, right? This is the sermon to end all sermons. And the crowds see him as one who teaches with authority, not like the scribes. And so we can assume this scribe is coming to Jesus thinking about what Jesus might give him. He might be thinking, man, if I follow Jesus, maybe he'll give me some tips and tricks on how to preach better. Maybe I'll get to go with him on his preaching circuit all the way up to Jerusalem. He's in it for the hype or the popularity. Teacher, he calls Jesus. And yet we know Jesus is so much more than just a teacher, right? Matthew's gonna leave us with two choices on how we call upon Jesus, teacher or Lord. And the scribe, he expects to follow Jesus merely as a teacher to another teacher. Jesus is gonna ask more of him. Verse 20, Jesus tells him, foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. So the scribe says, teacher, and Jesus counters him, son of man. What could that mean? This whole thing would have been shocking to the scribe. Even the animals have a place to stay. And Jesus doesn't even know where he's gonna sleep tonight. Not only that, Jesus drops the proverbial microphone and calls himself son of man. If you're new to the scriptures, Jesus is quoting Daniel chapter seven. You you all should go home and read it tonight. It's fantastic, 10 out of 10, recommend. Daniel has a vision, a heavenly vision of Yahweh God, the Father. And there's glory and power And Yahweh calls before him a man. And he'll call this man the son of man. And Yahweh God gives the son of man kingdoms and authority and dominion and power. Daniel sees the son of man as this cosmic king of the universe. And here's Jesus saying, I'm more than a teacher. I'm the king. And the scribe is thinking, wait a minute, kings have palaces, they have kingdoms, they got horses and chariots, they got everything, and you're you're a king and you don't even have a place to put your head on tonight. What? Jesus is messing with this guy's paradigm for what it could mean to follow him. This is Matthew's kingdom agenda, right? This isn't just any kingdom, this is the kingdom of heaven. It is an upside down kingdom where the first are last and the last shall be first. Where the desolate, the despised are exalted and loved by God. Jesus is the king of this kingdom and he is calling citizens into his kingdom but he's not begging them. 
He's not begging them to the point where he will change the kingdom so that they'll be a part of it. He invites them on his terms. Lord, another one of the disciples says, first, let me go and bury my father. So in verse 21, this disciple of Jesus speaks up. He realizes, okay, this is my chance to get my time off request in, okay? We're going to the other side of the lake. I need to get out of here. Whatever preconceived notions this guy has about following Jesus, they're gone. He just heard Jesus say, I don't even have a place to sleep tonight. And he's like, dang it. Consider this. Jesus has been with his disciples. And he calls them to go to the other side of the lake of Galilee, a place called Gennesaret. This doesn't just mean foreigners to the disciples. A good Jewish boy and a good Jewish girl, their, their job is to remain ritually pure, ritually clean. And interacting with Gentiles would put that at risk. And these aren't just Gentiles. What the, the, subte- the subtext is this is the opposition, this is the enemy. And Jesus wants to go over there Is he going to heal them? Is he gonna call them to follow him too? Can I follow a king who calls the opposition to follow him? Following Jesus now apparently includes abject poverty, humility of status, your cultural distinctives are completely ignored and at best thrown out. And this guy, this disciple's thinking, when will it end? Let me put in my time off request. Regardless of the many potential hardships to be faced on the journey of discipleship, this man says to Jesus, first, let me bury my father. First. Now, there's some debate about what this guy's asking. Is his dad dead and he's asking to actually go hold a ceremony and put him in the ground? Or is he asking to go be with his father who's alive but old and about to die maybe within the next year or so? And uh, in, in Jewish tradition, when your father would die, you'd put him in the ground, and then a year later, you would pull him back up once he was decomposed, take his bones, and put them in an estuary. So we, uh, scholars debate, we don't know 100% what this guy's asking, but we do know the implication. This disciple places immediate priority on something other than Jesus. Whether his father is dead or alive, Jesus takes issue that this father is seemingly more important than following Jesus. Verse 22, Jesus will respond to him. He says, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. That's metal. (laughs) Jesus rebukes this guy. And he tells them, you come and follow me. We need to ask, how how do we take Jesus' words here? What is he saying? Is this metaphor? Is this meant to be taken literally? Is this like spiritual? Again, the salient point is Jesus reprioritizes this man's discipleship to the thing that is most important, being with the king, king and kingdom at all costs. Discipleship to Jesus subverts our expectations of life. It subverts our prioritization of the things that we think are important, the things that we think Christian life should be, the things that we think the kingdom of heaven should be about. Now, like good New Testament Christians, we all know the kingdom of God isn't just brick and mortar. It's not the initiatives of the church. The kingdom of God is also and primarily begins in the hearts of men and women who give their allegiance to the king, right? Now here's the implications of that. If our hearts are the kingdom of heaven, Jesus, the king, has the right to reprioritize, reorder our lives how he sees fit. He has the right to say, hey, I know you were expecting this, but we're actually gonna do this instead. And if you like surprises, you're like, okay, cool, let's go, Jesus. I'm spontaneous and ready to follow you. If you like plans, good luck. I will be praying for you. Now, discipleship is to begin by pledging our allegiance to Jesus the King. 
to begin to further his domain into the frontier, to abide by the law of his kingdom, and to begin to embody it in our character, in our our life. Essentially, the kingdom mission is the Edenic mandate. You're like, Edenic what? In Genesis chapter two, in the Garden of Eden, there's man and woman, Adam and Eve. And God gives them a mission, a mandate, a task to fulfill. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Go and subdue the earth. So let's think about that for a second. Adam and Eve are made in the image of God. And they're told to make disciples. And they're told to bring the kingdom of God, to bring Eden, God's place, into the rest of the world in a way that images God. That's discipleship. For us to multiply disciples in a way that looks like Jesus and bring that into the culture, into the rest of the world. This is discipleship. The question we need to be asking is discipleship at what cost? We have to give up our own individual right and authority to define God's kingdom. We don't get to define our terms of discipleship. We have to actually bear our cross daily. Let's remember the words of John the Baptist in John chapter three, verse 30. He must increase and I must decrease. This is the heart of following Jesus. Okay, everyone, take a big breath. That was a lot. And we're gonna take a step back and we're gonna focus on two things. How discipleship to Jesus disrupts our expectations and disrupts our priorities. Okay, whatever expectations we have of following Jesus, let's just make it easy. Let's just throw them out the window now. (laughs) Whatever you want it to be like, whatever you want it to look like, let's just come to Jesus and look at him and see what following him is actually like. If you want to know what following Jesus is like, the best thing we can do is to look at his life. And this is what Jesus points the scribe to do, right? He tells the scribe, if you're gonna follow me, this is what my life is like. I don't even have a place to lay my head. It's not the lifestyle that you want, it's the lifestyle that Jesus has. You can be without comfort, at the mercy of God's will. Now that might sound daunting to some of us, but we know who our God is. We know that he's good and lovely and merciful and he will never leave and forsake us. So it's worthy of following him. That being said, we need to acknowledge the kingdom of God is not my best life now. That's a false gospel. In fact, the kingdom of God is marked by God's will right here and now. Even at the cost of our comfort, sometimes at the cost of our livelihood. Again, that thought might leave us uncomfortable, but before you quit, let's look at the life of Jesus because it is worth it. Jesus died a single man. He wasn't married, he had no romance to speak of. Now if you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. When did the sermon hit the singleness turn? What is going on here? Don't worry, don't have to brace yourself. In our culture, we seem to have this unspoken guarantee that you're entitled to a romance and sexual expression. Yet Jesus' life had no such guarantee. His life was filled with suffering and self-denial. In fact, we might wager to say that Jesus has experienced a loneliness that none of us will ever experience. Jesus was completely separated from the presence of God on the cross. His friends abandoned him. His mother watched him die a humiliating, public, gruesome death. What if you say yes to Jesus and he says, cool, I don't have this relationship for you. Cool, I don't have your life going in this direction. Is he worthy of our discipleship? I'm also picking on this one because I think in our American Christian subculture, 
Sometimes we elevate family and marriage to a place that rivals the kingship of Jesus. Now, families and couples, I'm not here trying to make you feel guilty, and single people, you're like, you're married, Andrew, what gives you the right to say that? Here, here's what I'm trying to say. I'm actually, my intention is to make families and couples passionate about the single people in the church. You have an opportunity to disciple and love these people like nobody else can. Single people, some of us need fathering and mothering. Husbands and wives, you can give that to them. You have a family, a culture of the kingdom of heaven that you can extend to people that don't have a family. And I'm not just talking about orphaned people, I'm talking about just any single person. Sometimes you gotta hear it from someone else other than mom and dad. Right, moms and dads? <laughs> Let's remember, Jesus said in Mark 3, 35, whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. If our expectation for following Jesus means our ideas of family, relationship, sexuality are unscathed, are we actually following Jesus? If I'm entitled to express romance and sexuality in whatever way I want, am I actually following the Jesus of the Bible? If I insulate my family, my marriage, our time and our resources from people in a different stage of life, am I actually following Jesus? When it comes down to it, do our expectations of life define discipleship or does Jesus define discipleship? If this is his relationship, does he get to shape the terms? Does he get to shape us? I found in my life, when it comes to following Jesus, that I can either have my expectations or I can grow, but I can rarely do both at the same time. Discipleship disrupts our expectations. Let's talk about priorities real quick. The second person in this story is a disciple of Jesus, the text tells us. And he comes to Jesus and makes this request to go and bury his father. And Jesus tells him no. That seems like a really reasonable request, right? But Jesus tells him, let the dead bury their own dead. Metal. In other words, Jesus defines a disciple as someone that is concerned primarily with the king in the kingdom. This isn't to say other things in life aren't important, but there is a, prior, a priority of importance and least importance. None of us like to be told, hey, that thing's really awesome that you like, but it's actually not as awesome as you think it is, so we're actually gonna, we're not gonna prioritize it. <laughs> right, no one likes being told that. But I think we need to remember the words of Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays to his Father. And he says, Father, not my will be done, but yours. Is this how we hold our priorities to Jesus? Not my will, Jesus, but your will be done. Now, during my time as a youth pastor, I've seen it all. I've seen people prioritize things above Jesus and make excuses for why they're doing that. And I'm not just talking about students, I'm talking about parents too, so brace yourself. <laughs> I've heard people say, hey, sorry, we're gonna stay home today because we're gonna watch the football game. I've heard people say, hey, sorry, I just don't really feel like spending the gas money to take my kids to church today. Or my personal favorite, it's just such a nice day and the sun is out, I just can't imagine putting my kids inside a church today. Oof, didn't know youth group was that bad. Pray for John, y'all. Um, look, I get it. Stuff happens. Life happens, and that's okay. There's no judgment. I've got a two-year-old. I know that life happens, okay? I've gone many sleepless a night because life happens at 2 a.m. Now, possibly the most frequent excuse that we get is, hey, you know, I didn't read my Bible this week. I didn't come to small group. 
I didn't prioritize Jesus because I just ran out of time. Sometimes it's said like this, I didn't have time for that. And I think this excuse is just so goofy because the truth is we all have the same 24 hours in a day. It would be more honest for us to say, I chose not to spend my time that way or I chose to spend my time differently. At the end of the day, you get to choose how you prioritize Jesus with your time. Saying I didn't have time doesn't magically remove the responsibility to respond to discipleship. When Jesus confronts this disciple, he says to him, you follow me. He doesn't focus on the uh, unfortunate circumstance of a deceased father. He places the responsibility directly in front of the disciple. There are many things in this world that beg for our attention. Phones, social media, politics, sports, kids, finances, career, health, education. But a disciple of Jesus puts the king and his kingdom before everything else. The hard truth is most of us would rather be happy than follow Jesus. We need to grapple with that. As I close, here's where I want to end. I want to ask us, maybe write it down and think on it this week. Is Jesus worthy of my discipleship? Let's look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. As he, Jesus, got into the boat, his disciples followed him. The segment of our passage ends with Jesus and his true followers separating themselves from the crowd. Now, not to ruin next week, Sean's going to preach a banger on the storm and the boat. But the disciples kind of get wrecked. Right? If you know the story, the disciples are like, help, and Jesus is like, <sighs> Now, I can't imagine the disciples knew what was coming next. But isn't that the point? The future was uncertain, and they still got in the boat to follow Jesus. They counted Jesus as worthy, despite the uncertainty. So I want to ask us again, is Jesus worthy? worthy of our discipleship? Is he worthy? Would I still follow the king if I knew I was about to go through a storm? Would I still follow the king if I knew he was gonna ask me to give up this relationship? Would I still follow the king if I knew I had to schedule differently? We need to ask ourselves as well, Am I in the boat with Jesus? Or am I in the crowd watching Jesus do cool stuff? We can lie to ourselves sometimes and say, yeah, I'm spiritual, I go to church. I read the verse of the day. But are we actually following Jesus? Though getting in the boat with Jesus is a promise of hardship, fear, and the testing of our faith, we can be sure of one thing. I'm with the king, and the king is with me. At the end of the book of John, Jesus tells the disciples of things to come and the cost of being a disciple. He tells them of trials they will experience, how they will suffer, how others will hate them, and specifically how they will fail him. But Jesus also says this. This is John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. On the other side of the cost of discipleship is a great reward, and it's the presence of Jesus. Again, the crowd might be following Jesus, but they are not experiencing his presence in the same way a disciple is. We need to ask ourselves right now, if I'm separated from Jesus, feeling that separation, is it because I'm not following him? 
Now, I'm not talking about works-based salvation, but I am talking about intimacy with Jesus. Jesus' presence in our lives is our greatest reward. So as the band comes up, I wanna give us some, some next steps towards Jesus. If you've listened to this sermon and you've been thinking to yourself, am I really following Jesus? Have I counted him as worthy? Am I in the crowd or am I with the disciples? Maybe a next step for you is looking for mentorship in the church. If you're single and young, maybe that looks like looking for a family to be like, hey, will you have dinner with me? Will you speak into my stage of life right now? Hey, this is the stuff I'm going through and struggling with. Have you guys ever experienced that? If you've got a family, maybe you've got some gray hairs, Maybe this is what discipleship looks like, looking for a single person saying, hey, want to come over and have some coffee or maybe you can come over and make me coffee. If you've been coming to Reach for a while, you've been checking us out, listening to sermons, worshiping with us, mingling in the lobby, maybe you need to join a small group Maybe you need to get real with a group of Jesus followers and do this thing for for real. There's no such thing as lone wolf Christianity. We need each other. Following Jesus doesn't look like mano y mano. It looks like a community and a family of people following Jesus together. Maybe you're in a small group and it's time to take a step deeper. Maybe you need to get, grab a few guys and a few gals and be like, hey, let's do a DNA. Let's do this thing for real. I need some accountability, I need some encouragement, and I am in a dark season and I need to be lifted up. I need to be pointed to Jesus in a real way. Maybe just very simply, the first step of discipleship looks like pulling out your calendar and penciling in time with Jesus. One of my mentors taught me If it's important to you, it will end up on your calendar. And that's just true about anything in life. But if we really want to follow Jesus, are we getting in the word? Are we spending time with him and taking steps into his presence? So if you've been asking yourself, is Jesus worthy to disciple me? Maybe now's the moment you get to change that. I want to encourage us to change that by repenting. Let's repent of rebelling against Jesus' authority, saying, nope, I get to define this, Jesus. This is my spiritual journey. I get to do what I want. Let's repent of that. Let's give up our expectations of how life is to be in exchange for Jesus' plan. Let's trade our priorities, the things we say are most important, for Jesus' presence. As the prayer team comes up, I want you to prayerfully consider how you might go to a godly man or woman of God and say, hey, will you just help me renounce this idol in my life? Will you pray for me to have the boldness to take the next step? As we close in worship, will you all uh, bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, we truly believe that you are worthy of our lives, our livelihood, our thoughts, our desires, our schedule, Jesus. And we don't just want that to be an empty, meaningless thought. We want to put some meat behind it, Jesus. Will you help us to take the next step according to your will? Will you help us to be bold in obedience, to be humble in submitting ourselves to you? Holy Spirit, I just pray for your presence here that you would guide your church, that you would guide your people. For those who are sitting right now and are worried and anxious about many things, would you help them to surrender those things to you? 
I'm reminded in the book of Romans, it says that his kindness leads us to repentance. So Jesus, I just ask for you to manifest your kindness to us right now in this room, that it is in your kind, your lowly stature, that we would follow you, knowing that it is a hard route, but that we have you with us. Will you give us wisdom and discernment as we search our lives for the idols that challenge you? Will you give us peace as we throw these things before your feet? We love you, Jesus. And we want to love you so much more. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen.